for Crema Media's policy, I'm Sane Zameni. Joining me today is investigative journalist Michael Schmidt to discuss his book titled Dead Flight, Apartheid Secret Doctrine of Disappearance. So Michael, for the benefit of our viewers, can you tell us what your book titled Dead Flight, Apartheid Secret Doctrine of, of Disappearance is all about and how the idea of writing about such revelations started? Well, the, uh, the primary title, Death Flight, refers to a practice of disappearing uh, political opponents by throwing their bodies in the ocean uh, from aircraft. This, this practice, in fact, uh, evolved in, um, it appears, uh, Madagascar in 1947 during an uprising by the indigenous people against the French colonists um, and was copied subsequently in the wars in Indochina, um, in Vietnam itself during the American period, but also during the uh, liberation war in Algeria um, and transmitted down into Argentina and by various routes into, into South Africa. I'm calling it a secret doctrine because it is a military, uh, it is in fact a military doctrine. Um, in other words, a military practice, a regulated, organized practice. Um, but a secret doctrine because it was one that has almost never been acknowledged as part of counterinsurgency. Um, and as I say, it revolves around disappearance. So, yeah. And Tell us about a group of six to eight villagers that you, you, you mentioned in the book who, who were headed onto a French military plane in the eastern Madagascar. Now this is where I believe it's quite possible that the doctrine began because weirdly enough, the, uh, the, the French military officer, he, he'd been, he was a, he was, he was a flying, uh, flying lieutenant with the French Air Force. He'd been drinking with the, the local uh, garrison commander. They were outraged that local um, uh, holy men, essentially local uh, uh, spiritists, were supporting the insurrection by claiming that they could turn uh, French bullets to water and all this kind of thing. So they'd arrested a bunch of these guys and then they decided to to take a flight and drop these guys out over their, their home villages um, in this rather gruesome uh, practice. The, the weird thing is that he actually boasted about this practice and as a result became quite famous within French military circles and was never in fact censured for this. Uh, rose to become quite a high ranking officer and retired comfortably with a Legion d'honneur uh, um, uh, award. So um, th this practice was really raised up and, and, and hailed by French um, military personnel and therefore was, was mimicked, was replicated. And then other people like the Americans and, and, and so forth who were interacting with the, with the French on, on developing counterinsurgency doctrine picked up on this practice as well. And Michael, five decades later, on July 12, 1979, a similar gruesome event that took place as well, which involved our country now, which led to the death of two SWAPO members. Can you briefly tell us about that? Yeah, this is kind of a strange event because a month before this happened, the, uh, the head of the Naval School of Mechanics in uh, Buenos Aires, a guy called Vice Admiral Ruben Chamorro, um, was uh, posted to Pretoria as a naval attaché to Argentina. Now he'd been responsible for the, 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 the Naval School of Mechanics was the primary torture center during the, the Junta's reign in Argentina and from whence some 4,000 people were disappeared by death flight. So it's, it's kind of remarkable that this happened about a month before our own death flights began. What, what happened is that we, uh, th this was a, an ultra secret unit disguised as civilians, but run by special forces. Uh, it was very tightly controlled and need to know basis. The death flights were essentially commanded by the general officer commanding special forces. The instructions were given usually verbally or over the radio. 
um, directly to the pilot and his assistant, who was a special forces colonel, and they would be told to pick up uh, a package or some packages in then Southwest Africa. They would fly to an airfield. They were in fact based in Lanseria in South Africa. They would fly to an airfield in Namibia, uh, refuel, go on to the pickup point where they would be delivered um, uh, prisoners of war, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes dead, but mostly alive. They had to in fact be killed before being disappeared. Um, initially by strangulation and later on by poisoning. Um, and then they were, their bodies were flown out to a remote airfield. The, the clothes were burnt. The rear door of the aircraft was hidden in the dunes and the aircraft would fly out about 60 to 90 nautical miles off the coast uh, at a, an altitude of about 12,000 feet they would look around and make sure that there were no fishing trawlers or other observers in there and they would make the drop before returning to pick up the, the, the door of the aircraft and fly on home. Do you know if the families of those two uh, SWAPO members were, were able to get information about their loved ones? Yeah, this is a very difficult part of the tale because the whole reason for conducting disappearances in the first place, this, you know, the, the, the rather wicked rationale behind conducting disappearances, is so you can claim, well, we never had this guy in our custody in the first place. So um, in the chaos of war, particularly asymmetrical war, guerrilla warfare, um, lots of people disappear for a number of different reasons. Some people may go into exile and uh, meet a woman and settle down and not bother to tell their comrades. Um, other people may get predated upon by lions in the bush or step on a landmine and, 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 and their, their fate not be known. Um, so there are lots of disappearances in the mix. It's very hard for families who have lost people during this conflict to say, we now know for sure that our, our family member who disappeared was among those who were disappeared by this method, who were in fact thrown into the ocean. Michael, I'm sure a lot of people have asked you this question as to how were you able to get such sensitive information? Yeah, look, the, the, this information was not known, the death flights were not known during the Truth Commission, despite the fact that its work was really in-depth and probing and, and very wide-ranging. Um, it was vaguely aware that there was such a unit. It was aware that there was such a unit that had evolved into the, the, the notorious CCB, the Civil Cooperation Bureau. Um, but the, the testimony by the generals very cleverly kind of telescoped the prehistory of, of the CCB to occlude this, the period during which the, most of the death flights occurred. So it wasn't known during the TRC. It did come out during the vote of the Son trial. Um, and that made everybody rock back on their heels in surprise. But the Vodabasan trial was, in fact, primarily a very long-winded fraud trial. And the, uh, the murder charges, particularly the, the, these uh, charges relating to the death flights, because they occurred outside of the country, uh, were ruled by the judge not to fall within his jurisdiction. So that aspect of, of, of the trial rapidly sort of fell behind, you know, into people's rear view mirror, and they forgot about it. Um, also, it was very dangerous at the time um, to, to probe into this. The, uh, the, the primary operators involved, a very handful of, of, of specialist forces operators, um, had in, in some instances certified hundreds of kills under their belt. So, I mean, these are pretty dangerous guys to, to deal with at the height of their powers. To some degree, it, it really relied on the passage of years and these men to move into old age and start to consider, I suppose, their careers and consider whatever their version of meeting their maker was to, to be prepared to speak. And not everybody was, but uh, those that were, were remarkably forthcoming and because I'd done my background research so uh, uh, meticulously, I realized uh, amazingly honest.
And in, in chapter 11, you talk about the Iron Fist of SA's new heartland policy that was extended uh, across to Southwest Africa, where a new counterinsurgency unit was established in January 1979. Can you briefly tell us about that? Well, th this is the establishment of, of KUFUT, which means crowbar. So this is the Southwest Africa Police Counterinsurgency Unit. Um, it gained quite a notorious reputation because not only were they rough and ready, but they, they were paid, their, their men were paid uh, kill bonuses uh, for the number of bodies that they could demonstrate that they'd been responsible for. So this naturally led to a, a kind of a mission creep where, where they'd wind up killing people that, that weren't guerrillas, that weren't engaged in the war, um, just to basically earn cash. Um, it started out as a small tracking unit and then evolved into a quite a formidable um, uh, contingent of, of men, of, of uh, infantry soldiers, backed up by armored vehicles. Um, the, the, you know, the, this is not the primary focus of, of the book. However, it was this unit that, amongst others, would deliver captives to uh, Delta 40, which is the unit that I'm focusing on, for disappearance. And now on January 1st, 1981, the entire Special Forces structure was overhauled. Why was that? Um, it was because uh, Special Forces had uh, evolved as an experimental outfit, uh, quite secretly, in fact, uh, from 1970, so secretly that the, the, the head of the Defence Force wasn't allowed to know that it was happening, mainly because they knew that he wasn't really uh, in favour of Special Forces. And it eventually evolved rather organically to the point where they decided, okay, it needed to, it needed to have, it needed to be looked at um, in terms of its command and control, they needed to have a big rethink about it. The weird thing was they brought in a civilian um, uh, business consultant to look at it in terms of, you know, sort of a, as a business proposal, you know, are, are they working according to the best business practices? Um, one of the units that they were tasked with looking at was uh, Delta 40. Um, and although the, the consultant was, was told, was not told that the unit actually existed, was just, just told that this was a speculative idea of a, uh, a specialist unit within special forces. Um, and it's largely because of that consultant's design principles that the unit, uh, as it was renamed Barnacle, became to be finalized and grew to about 40 members at its peak. And lastly, Michael, what else will the readers get from your book? Well, I think the thing that will really raise eyebrows is not so much the, the particular transnational war crimes um, committed uh, during this period. Um, you know, there were obviously many dark deeds on all sides in this period. But the fact that they did occur on all sides relates directly to what happened subsequently in terms of dealing with it. The TRC was obviously a, a, an instrument of trying to come to a, a natural uh, and national um, uh, recognizance of the whole uh, damage done during the apartheid era on, by all parties, whether it was RVOB or PAC or, or NK or, or SADF or, or police or whatever. Um, but the curious thing is that I discovered really by accident that there had been a, a top level series of ultra secret negotiations over 1997 until early, um, early 2003 between the very top uh, levels of the ANC. So the, the deputy presidents and, and a hand-picked uh, uh, coterie of, of cabinet ministers, not even all of the cabinet ministers were aware of this, and the old apartheid generals. And their objective was to prevent prosecutions on any side from coming out of the TRC. Now this has become 
very much a matter of debate currently in the newspapers. You, you have a story just about once a week, twice a week, three times a week these days on why were there no prosecutions? The TLC recommended prosecutions. Why have there been no prosecutions? Um, finally, we can reveal why. That in fact, there were negotiations towards the deal. There in fact was no deal. The deal fell apart in, uh, on, on 17th of February 2003, when the generals walked out saying, look, we want a blanket amnesty, whereas the ANC was saying, no, we will grant amnesty on a case-by-case -case basis in exchange for full disclosure. So the same formula as was applied at the TLC. Um, but the generals were not interested. The weird thing was that the ANC continued on its own bat to uh, create a, a subsequent amnesty process that eventually wound up being de facto illegal because they interfered in the independence of the National Prosecuting Authority and prevented them from going ahead and prosecuting uh, people who had not applied for or who had been granted amnesty by the TRC itself and who yet still had very viable cases going against them. That was Michael Schmidt in conversation with Polity about his book title, Dead flight, apartheid secret to crime of disappearance.